Okay, everybody, welcome back for another edition of our Reversing Labs Threat Research Roundup. I'm Paul Roberts. I'm the cyber uh, content lead here at Reversing Labs and uh, the host of this event. And uh, thank you all to everybody who uh, joined in. We do this quarterly, and it's um, basically a way for us to get some of our very accomplished uh, researchers all on the same line and just talk about what they've found. Uh, and that's what we're going to be doing today. Um, okay, um, so we have an amazing group of Reversing Labs researchers with us today. Um, I introduce myself. I'm Paul Roberts, our content lead. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Lucia, let's start with you. Say hi. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Lucia Valentic. I'm a threat researcher here at Reversing Labs. I've been with Reversing Labs uh, for over a year now, and here I'm trying to find some interesting packages on public repositories and make analysis out of them and blogs. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Um, Carlo. Hi, I'm Carlo Zanke. Uh, I work as a software tech teacher in Atreversing Labs, and my job is day-to-day uh, -day monitoring of open source public repositories and searching for new and interesting threats. Carlo is the author of a lot of our research reports, uh, and a newer addition to the team is uh, Peter. Say hi. Hello, my name is Peter Kirchmeier. I'm a software threat researcher at Reversing Labs. I've been with uh, Reversing Labs for um, almost a year now. And my job is to basically the same as theirs, to monitor open source repositories and try to find something interesting. That's great. Thanks all of you for, for joining us. Um, we've had a, a pretty eventful quarter that we're gonna talk about. Before we get going, just for the folks who are on the line a little bit, just about uh, reversing labs where we all work. Um, we're a company that is um, jointly headquartered in Zagreb, Croatia, as well as in Cambridge here in the U.S., um, 300 employees, and um, we've been around actually for 15 years. We're a startup, but we're, we're, we've got a long history, uh, and if you know about us, you might be, it might be because we are the owners of the world's largest threat repository, the largest file lake of uh, malware and goodware that we've been using for, um, you know, um, malware threat intelligence um, and reverse analysis over the last uh, 15 years, working with really some of the some of the biggest companies in the world, um, uh, both in the tech sector, financial services, you, you know, you name it. Um, that data set, you know, a 40 billion uh, file uh, uh, repository, Again, of malware, goodware, um, we're more than eight times the closest offering in, in terms of size. Um, and again, we've been working, you know, with, you know, you name the security vendor, chances are they're, they're, they work with us to get access to that, that file repository, 4,800 different file types, 400 different binary types. Um, and every day we're analyzing around 15 million um, new files. Um, and we b operate both in, you know, as I said, malware threat intelligence, and also increasingly, as we're going to talk about today, around the um, growing issue of uh, software supply chain security. These two, these two areas are converging, right? Because those malware threats that used to be coming at your network perimeter are now infiltrating your software supply chain. It's a much more effective route to get access to sensitive environments, and you need a company like Reversing Labs that has the ability to. Uh, identify those threats uh, in your supply chain. So we're going to talk about that today. We're talking about malware. We're also talking about open source um, and, and uh, software. So um, let's see. Uh, the agenda, uh, we're going to first of all just start off orienting you all about how uh, Carlo and Lucia and Peter uh, hunt for threats and how that works or how our technology works. Um, and then we're going to dig into um, some of the stuff we found um, uh, related to GitHub-based threats, DLL sideloading attacks, this campaign we just wrote about recently, BitClip, um, that was really targeting kind of crypto industry uh, um, apps. Um, and of course, we'll take your questions and talk about how you can respond to these threats, okay? Um, and again, use that Q&A feature uh, if you've got questions you want this group to ask. Okay. so. Um, First of all, uh, 
I, I'd, I'd throw this to all three of you. It seems to me like we've had a pretty busy quarter in terms of just stuff cropping up on open source repos, uh, Python, NPM, um, NuGet. Uh, what's your sense on just the overall level of threat activity in, especially in these these open source repositories? Well, if I may say the the level of the threat is fairly present in the same amount. It's not going away. Uh, threat actors are continuously publishing new packages and we get to see them on a daily basis. What we know to the last uh, half of the year is that they are not only focused on NPM and PyPy, but are also expanding their reach in several uh severe campaigns targeting uh, other repositories, mainly Nougat in the recent months we have seen, but recently we have spotted some activity on uh, repositories like VS Code Marketplace and Ruby Gems. So it basically depends on the amount of packages published to those repositories. The more packages those repositories have, the more lucrative they are for malicious actors to get their share off the cake there. Yeah, yeah. And could you just talk about how, like, how do we, when when you're when you're doing this research, like, how how do you work? What tools are you using? How do you go about figuring out? Oh, we've got a malicious or a suspicious package here, and we need to dig into it deeper. And and, and how does that work exactly? We have uh, internal processing setup where we on a daily basis analyze uh, newly published uh, packages to the repositories we monitor like npm, pypy, and that we mentioned before. We process those packages with our uh, Spectre Assurance platform and uh, perform static analysis of those packages. So basically we unpack them, extract interesting files from them of all types we support, and then uh, apply a set of rules which help us uh, extract uh, behavior indicators that can show us what those files are capable of. So the main difference is we don't run them in a uh, virtualized environment and collect uh, behavior during dynamic analysis, which costs time and money, but our product is capable of doing it in static analysis, during static analysis without uh, actually running the package. And then we have a uh, predefined set of rules which we created, our threat hunting team, which trigger uh, warnings for us. And uh, after we go through the warnings that are triggered, we triage those packages and try and see what is interesting and in that way find eventual malware. And one of the things that we discovered uh, this quarter are some attacks uh, using the GitHub platform. Uh, Lucia, can you talk about what you discovered, um, what types of packages uh, you discovered and what was going on with these campaigns? Uh, of course. In the last uh, couple of months, we discovered uh, several packages. Uh, we had two campaigns. Carlo discovered a few packages, PIPI packages, uh, where I discovered a few NPM packages. Uh, so basically, we seen uh, GitHub being used in a way that we haven't seen before. Uh, with PIPI packages that Carlo found, uh, they used uh, actually GitHub gists uh, as a way to um, to get payload and to uh, execute malicious content. Uh, they also use commit messages uh, for you know, storing malicious payload. Um, and I found NPM packages, as I said, uh, where uh, GitHub was being used uh, to store stolen data. You know, we've seen GitHub being used uh, to store some open source malicious softwares, but we haven't seen being used in this way. So these GitHub GIS, these are this is basically like shared code snippets that that you can they can either be public or secret, um, but you can just share them between developers. Um, how how are the how is that feature kind of leveraged maliciously 
Um, because my understanding is we haven't seen this that much. I think there was one other thing, one other incident back in 2019 that got written about, but it sounds like the type of thing a malicious actor should be all over, but, but what are some of the, I guess, what are the limitations and how are these, how is this used feature used maliciously? Uh, well, basically, you can't uh, search them on GitHub unless you are the author of, uh, of them or if you are logged in. Uh, so that's great for malicious actors. Uh, but in this particular package, malicious author actually expanded a setup tool command uh, and added a new one called uh, egg info. Uh, so when that command is used, uh, basically, uh the the package uh it looks like it sends telemetry info but what it actually does um uh, actually uh it uh, fetches uh url to some github gists gists um and then it executes it and they are you know malicious actors stored stored uh, malicious content and that's how it was used And Carla, when when uh, on the issue of using the the git commit messages, could you just dig into that a little bit? What was the um, how how were those implemented as part of that campaign? Yeah, that was interesting because usually uh, people just host a raw file on GitHub and uh, fetch its content and execute uh, the, the content from there. Uh, and the problem is everybody sees when you browse to GitHub repository, you can see that there's malicious content there. But what uh, malicious actors did, they put the malicious command into the commit messages. They prefixed the commit message with some specific character sequence. And when they fetched commit messages with standard Git uh, protocol, they parsed the content of the commit message itself, not the content of the commit of the code, but of the description message. And if they found the prefix, uh, they knew that the command Python executable code was following in basic foreign code form. So basically they didn't use the standard features that Git offers for sharing code, but abused instead the commit messages and hidden the encoded commands into the description itself. Very interesting. And um, I guess, you know, this is this is all part of a bigger trend, right? Which is, you know, malicious actors leveraging this open source, you know, features and infrastructure, right, to support malicious campaigns and malicious activities. Um, what, you know, what is the advice that you have to to let's say a development organization um, about you know the level of scrutiny that they need to um, uh, be applying to you know their own development developers and and files and infrastructure to kind of pick up on this stuff because this, this stuff seems very subtle it seems like the type of thing it might be very difficult to to notice um, we're we're picking it up because we're we're scanning the file right but but um, proactively, how could you how could you spot this stuff? Is it even possible? I mean, some of the things you can pay attention to, you know, you can use uh, already packages or libraries that are common in communities. Uh, so not some random packages. Uh, you can also, uh, you know, check if uh, how many downloads there are if there is some weird things some red flags that uh could be raised for example if some versions are weird or if uh, mm -hmm. there are low number of downloads or something like that but yes as you said you know those things are is, are subtle so it's a little bit harder to sometimes catch it and because you can't you know you can't search through every file and every right. library right. you include None of those things are necessarily mean that it's malicious, but there are things that should get your, you know, kind of, you know, suspicion raised, right? Um, about, yeah. you know, the the provenance, the origin of this this file, I guess. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so the other thing that we're seeing is, you know, a, a kind of merging of. <laughs> 
you know, uh, traditional, well, well documented attack techniques, and seeing them start to crop up in the context of you know uh, open source uh, infrastructure and open source code, um, and that was something that came up in in some research we wrote about this quarter um, back in in January on DLL side loading um, attacks being observed um, and. Um, who wants to talk about that? Is that P Peter? Is that you? Uh, DLL side loading? Yeah. 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 So basically, tell us what you Carl, found. Uh, Carlo was the one that found the package on January the 10th. I just uh, researched it a bit more. So basically, that uh, package contained a, a setup Python script uh, uh, that uh, downloaded two files. One file was an exe, and the other was uh, a DLL. Uh, and the, D the exe was actually a legit file that was signed. Uh, with a certificate from Kingsoft Corporation, which is basically some uh, Chinese uh, company. Uh, and uh, what it did is it ran itself after it downloaded those two files. So it ran the exe. And the exe expects uh, there on the file system somewhere to be a DLL, right? And it only cares that the DLL has a specific name and a specific, specific export function. Uh, it does not care what the functionality is, but once it founds, fi finds it, it loads it, and it uh, starts to execute the exported functions code. In this case, the DLL that it downloaded, that it found, was malicious, and it downloaded a payload uh, that started uh, to infect the victim's computer. So that's basically how the DLL side loading was performed here. DLL side loading is uh, basically used so that uh, it's uh, harder to detect uh, because uh, you can't really detect it with dynamic analysis. But uh, if you use our tools you that use the static analysis, you can find them more easily. Do we have any idea of what the um, purpose of this attack was or who the subject of the attack was, like what was going on um, to, to behind this? Uh, yes, well, uh, the... Uh, the, uh, the, the, I don't know if I can call them victims, but uh, the packages were called uh, NP6, which was some French marketing automation company. Uh, so probably the, the targets here were the users of, uh, of uh, those platforms, of, of those tools. And that's often the case, right, with these campaigns that you can sort of infer from the package names or, you know, who, or, or or other you know graphics and stuff that you're finding within these within these like what the what the purpose was, um, yeah. You yeah you said there was a um, file that had a legitimate certificate belonging to a Chinese company. Does that give us any insight into the origin of the attack? Should we can we infer from that like oh this must be you know Chinese uh, espionage no, or I I can't can say with the confidence that uh, we can pinpoint this to to China because. They could have used any any exe that they want. It's just like a, uh, it's just like a boat that that does its thing there. Right. Would if if you were using that French platform and had mistakenly grabbed this package, would it have done what it said it did? In other words, would would it have just broken your stuff and and you would have figured it out because like yeah. oh this doesn't work, it's doing something else? Or actually, would it have worked? doing what it advertised it did. Yeah, so no, it only contained the malicious functionality and nothing 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 extra. Okay. So that's sort of a lower tier of supply like right like the best supply chain attacks like the package yeah. does exactly what it says it does but it's doing malicious stuff too and then there's a sort of lower tier where it's like yeah this is just a way to get malware onto your system. Yeah. It's if you yeah. install this, uh, you you see right away. Okay, so nothing's happening. Was this about right. uh, some more clever attacks would be unnoticeable? So you would uh, they would do what they advertise, and you would be you wouldn't be wiser. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Carlo, Lucia, Lucia, what what um what should we think about seeing this? I, I know Lucia, I think you you found a DLL side loading attack in an open source package going back, I think to twenty twenty three or twenty twenty two, right? Um, but does does this type of thing turn up often? Uh, well, I'm monitoring right now npm on VS Code marketplace, and mm -hmm. uh, since last year, I haven't seen uh, DLL side loading. This is actually the first time that we have seen. 
again, the LL side loading emerging on, at least on public repositories. Uh, I cannot say for sure for other things. Carlo, any, uh, anything to add on that? Yeah, so basically the other side loading is something that is quite common in uh, usual malware campaigns, not uh, targeting supply chains and open source tax repositories, but it's fairly uncommon uh, in this place. The last thing I remember was Lucias, and before that there was a PyPy campaign that you abused the other side loading, but not as stage one, but one of the later stages of the attack, like stage two or stage three. So it's fairly uncommon in OSS package, uh, open source package repositories and malware place there. So basically, uh, but it's an old and known technique and it does what does quite well. So it is designed to make detection harder by running it, running malicious code from a DLL side loaded by a legitimate DLL, which has hundreds of downloads, which was analyzed multiple times. Usually it's digitally signed proper certificate. So it's about making things harder for defenders and uh, making them uh, waste more time and resources to detect it. Is this something that would get noticed or detected, you know, once this package was executed, like, is there EDR going to start, you know, throwing up red flags or, or something like that, or is it something that's likely to get overlooked? Well, it is possible that it will detect, it depends on the security configuration you have, but if you run it, for example, in, uh, some virtual sandbox or something like that, uh, you wouldn't likely detect it because uh, first you will likely uh, run the executable without DLL in the environment and the malicious code wouldn't get triggered. And if you would try to run DLL, well, rarely anyone tries to run DLLs in sandbox environment. It's not an often practice. Usually executable files get run in the sure. analysis. So. It depends on the setup, how you have. How you have. Yeah. Let me remind the audience, um, we are taking questions. So if you want to use the Q&A feature and, you know, you have three kind of, you know, supply chain threat researchers online, and want to ask them a question. Um, a lot of expertise. Uh, so uh, one of the, um, one of the uh, campaigns that we discovered this quarter uh, was what we call BipClip. And um, it targeted the um, well, it was really aimed at the cryptocurrency uh, marketplace. Um, Pidar, that was a, another one of your um, research reports. Could you tell us this a little bit about this was on Python package index? These packages were discovered. Um, kind of what brought these packages to your attention first, and uh, what you found when you when you looked more closely at them. I think that was uh, Carlos. <laughs> yeah, that was mine. No oh, sorry, my bad, Carlo. You're right. You're right. No problem. So, what's interesting in this story is uh, crypto assets are one of the most popular targets of uh, threat actors in public source repositories. That's uh, anomaly. I wouldn't call it even anomaly. That's something that's uh, become standard for the last more than half a year, almost a year now. So. It's about typical stealing of money. So crypto assets are the easiest way to steal and get money for yourself and some value. If you do industrial espionage, you steal data and then have to sell it. This way you steal the live money. And uh, since the VN Connect campaign uh, in the July 2023 and the whole North Korean in, in, uh, appearance in open source package repository scene, uh, which we had uh, then uh, the open source package uh, supply chain attacks on aiming at stealing cryptocurrency assets have beca become present on weekly basis. So what's interesting here is that the attack and campaign was designed from two packages. You had one non-malicious legitimate package that was uh, implementing the advertised feature and it also included a dependency on a malicious package 
which contain the malicious functionality. And if you are a developer, you will likely uh, look at the source code present at the best. You will take a look at the source code present in the package you're using, but rarely anyone scans for what is included in the dependencies. So most of small companies don't have resource, nor knowledge, nor personnel to perform yeah. such uh, analysis. You likely need to use uh, mature security tools to help you in that task. And what is interesting, there were several packages. Uh, they were designed to provide functionality to retrieve your lost wallets uh, by using BIP39 mnemonics, which is a well-known uh, specification that designed to help uh, crypto users. And the biggest part of the story is that we found the Hack the Crypt package, which was published in December 2022 and was up on PyPy for more than a year, and it had more than 4,000 downloads in that period. Uh, mm -hmm. The campaigns we usually detect uh, are detected in less than a month since they are published. Uh, they have only a few hundred of downloads, so the impact usually isn't big. In this case, we have more than 4,000 downloads, and even if we remove the bots and mirrors, that's still a significant number of targets that got infected with that stealing malware and and we know that this was so the the package that was which was hash decrypt that was downloaded so many times um this was a standalone package it wasn't part of one of these pairs but what was the lure what would have what developers who would have downloaded that what were they looking for what yeah, functionality was, were they looking for yeah it was a standalone package on pi pi but there was uh project on github that uh, included it as a malicious dependency so basically people people were alert to use those projects on github clone them and use it for their purposes and the source code contained uh inclusion of the malicious hash decrypt package so it was a free keeper checker and the whole story was running around bip39 mnemonics on on recovering lost wallets so anybody who loses wallet likes and wants to get it back as soon as possible and if they in they in that per they try to find tools that can help them or if you're a developer who wants to design such a tool you likely don't wish to implement bp39 functionality on its own you will look for an open source library that can help you do that and that's how this got into the broader audience so you likely are a developer who wants to implement something. You search, do some bit of Googling, okay, this project solved the pro problem for me. And in this case, the project really did what it advertised, but it did a bit more, which you right. weren't aware of. Right. So from the so the attackers would have had this these um mnemonics exported to them, and then presumably that would allow them rather than the yes. wallet owner to go and, and claim the the um lock. Or, yes, or, when you uh, lost search wallet. for yeah. those tools, you will find a bunch of online tools and everybody says, don't you use offline online tools? You don't know who is doing uh, anything behind that when you write a mnemonic. So it's better to use a local tool, which is not uh, behind some web page, but you have access to. But in this case, you can look at the code of the project you downloaded. And you think, okay, this is clear, but you don't, but you miss an import and a call to some init function, which basically triggers the whole extraction sequence later. Really interesting. And and I guess the issue here, um, and uh, Lucia and Peter are interested in your thoughts on this as well. You know this dependency risk, malicious dependencies, um, is is very difficult for developers to um, spot. But what um, what are some ways that they can that they can become 
aware of you know threats that might be lurking not in the actual package itself but in in a file dependency is there is there any easy solution short of like digging into each one of those dependencies and looking for some of the some of the suspicious signs that we've talked about you know um, new packages you know random version numbers stuff like that uh, well, I'm not sure how to answer this, so maybe Carl or Peter can help me. But basically, you know, you can have packages and they can have million dependencies, you know, dozen and dozen dependencies. So it is a bit harder to go through all of them because, as Carlos said, not every company has, uh, you know, money or enough people to go through everything. Um, and it's a tedious job. So, yeah, that that issue is hard to catch actually yeah we need need new tools i guess right yeah yeah um, if you're a small size company it is likely that uh, from your standpoint of the budget and the expenses it will be uh, cheaper for you to use some mature security tool than to invest into your own knowledge for threat hunting repository, securing your software supply chain into a person who knows how to detect malware and how to handle it. Uh, if you are a big size company, you will probably you will perhaps have such a team, but you will also have to invest continuously into improving them because this type of threats is emerging and changing on a daily basis. So in the end, it is quite a specific niche of cybersecurity and there are hundreds and thousands of open source package, packages in the open source package repositories. And it is likely that you won't have access to historical knowledge about classification of those packages and it will consume lots of your resources to find uh, threats and protect yourself. That seems particularly if you're working in in on applications or or functions functionality that's related to industries like cryptocurrency, right? Where we know it's a major target of both cyber criminal and nation state actors. You know, um, North Korea uh, very interested in in using stolen cryptocurrency to kind of support their government, um, and then obviously cyber criminal groups is interested in kind of robbing robbing crypto banks. Um, so that would seem like if you're if you're working on a project like that, you need to kind of have an even different level of awareness and vigilance around some of these threats, it would seem like, right? Yeah. Uh, for example, people often say it's enough to look at the trustability of the sources. Okay, I won't use some uh, low reputation packages. I'm going to use popular one, which are trustworthy, which have millions of dollars and such. But then sooner or later, the compromise happens, as you said, likely by nation state attackers or not necessarily that depends on the type of the incident. Uh, for example, recently there was Ledger Connect kit incident where uh, the NPM account got corrupted by uh, leaking of passwords, I don't know what, but you had a trustworthy package which got compromised in the repository and in a short time there was a malicious version published and there were hundreds of downloads of that malicious versions in less in only a matter of hours so trustworthiness is not always enough you need to check the actual content even of the trustworthy files and uh, packages so the higher the stakes, the higher high level actors, like you said, nation state actors will be involved and it will be harder for you to detect and you will have a shorter time span to detect the threat before you get compromised. So we've got a couple questions that have come in. Um, I'm gonna take, just take them in order. Um, Marissa had the first question, how common is ransomware from your view, the VD, VIR, Verizon data, breach investigations report. Okay, <laughs> it's like processing that. 
don't know, uh, says as much as 24% of malware has a ransomware component. Do you, does that seem likely? And I guess I would kind of extend it and say, do we see, did, when we peek under the covers at some of these campaigns, does it seem like there's a ransomware angle here going on or, or not? Well, I can uh, say that in the open source package repositories, uh, ransomwares aren't that common. Uh, I believe that ransomware attacks are usually performed in traditional campaigns like phishing campaigns and such stuff. We aren't monitoring the entire uh, threat landscape. We are focusing on open source package repositories and usually uh, people that target software supply chain have uh, different motivation for the attacks, not so much destructive as much as trying to get financial gain or some sensitive information and later use them for perhaps even a ransomware attack, I don't know, but uh, these uh, attacks aren't that usual in open source uh, package repositories. So we have a, another question this is from an anonymous attendee. Um, how can organizations effectively integrate security practices into their development life cycle to identify and mitigate these threats? So the types of things we're talking about. Um, and is there much of a role for community-driven security initiatives for safeguarding open source ecosystems. So some of the stuff we've seen from Google and, and others, you know, the sort of let's clean up open source, let's, let's you know, lock down the security on some of these widely used, you know, libraries and stuff like that. Is there, is, is that working? Is that paying off or, or not? Yeah, well, the problem is that uh, there's a huge amount of packages published to those, to these open source package repositories. And uh, it, isn't, it isn't likely that uh, no open source initiative or community initiative will be able to security vet all the packages that get, that get published. It's hard, it's time consuming, people consuming, and in the end packages get published on a daily basis. Uh, it's that that would be an enormous queue of packages to analyze. In the end, you are left alone for yourself to make sure what you are using is uh, what you really need. It's, there are good initiatives, like, I don't know, uh, initiatives to, let's say, perform, uh, take, I don't know, 100 uh, most popular uh, networking libraries and they are recommended to be used and such stuff. Mm -hmm. But again, new versions get published like in Ledger Connect Kit, that kit would end up uh, on such list. And you can't expect that the uh, open source community will get to detect that threat in just a few hours, which were needed for your crypto assets to be stolen. So yeah. It is a good it is a good idea, but I'm not sure it will uh, be able to help yourself. If you're a company, you likely won't you won't be able to lean on that such initiatives uh, to protect your uh, software Seems environment. Like you will... There's like a there's like a long tail problem here with open yeah. source, right? Like yes, it's there a are these... massive right. it's a massive right. Uh, right. space of that packages out there and it's unlikely that anyone will be able to analyze all of them. It's a good initiative, it can be useful, you can use it to help yourself, but again, it's your security environment and um, you need to care, take care of it. No one else will be able to care it instead of you. Yeah, Lucia, Peter, um, are, are the measures that like open source platforms are taking to increase security? So some of the monitoring or some of the, you know, um, access security using two-factor do, do you see that as having any impact or are there new kind of or, or are there new initiatives to to help just from the platform provider standpoint you know kind of improve the quality of what's on these repositories these package managers uh where as far as i uh i know uh, i know pipi has uh, introduced last year i think uh two-factor identification and uh, I think they uh, we have seen the 
there are no many there are no many packages there anymore there have been every day a dozen a dozen uh, malicious pipi packages but now i think the number has uh, fallen down uh, also i think npm has two factor identification um, we also have seen uh, a drop in the number uh, vs code marketplace for example has um, a automatic scanner so every extension that is published on VS Code Marketplace uh, gets scanned, at least based on their documentation. Uh, so, you know, public repositories, they do uh, use some tools and they do have initiatives to uh, reduce number of malicious content on their sites. But uh, we still see that malicious actors are persistent. They are still writing code, malicious code every day. They are still publishing malicious packages, samples. Uh, so we haven't seen that, you know, publishing of malicious content has stopped. And I, I don't think we will see that in near future because, you know, new ways and new threats are always being published. Uh, so, yeah. you know, every few months we see something new, basically, or every few weeks we see something new. Hmm. So I was thinking about some... Go ahead, well, Carlo. Yeah, yeah. Regarding the previous question we were answering, uh, there was a question how to integrate uh, that security analysis into their development process. Well, basically, you need to be aware that uh, challenges are coming from all sources. And if you wish to use open source code, you just need to accept that you will have to perform security vetting of each package you are intend to use and each new version of that package that comes. And you likely won't be able to do it on your own so try and find some of security tools they are including ours uh, present out there that can help you do that uh, most of them su support some kind of integration into continuous in uh, development and continuous integration process so uh, those tools are designed to help developers and they have people behind them who constantly do such to improve those tools. And uh, you just need to be aware that you can't just say, okay, this is a popular package, I can trust it. It's, there's no way for that to say anymore. Yeah, yeah. So I was thinking about some of the some of the takeaways that we have for our audience. And I would say we've got a little bit of time left. So if you've got questions, feel free to throw them into the Q&A um, uh, window and, uh, and we'll get to them uh, before we break. Um, I mean, obviously, the big takeaway here, we've got just a string of research reports that, that have come out this quarter. We, we didn't talk about all of them or a few of them we, we kind of threw in there, but um, is that, you know, threat actors are leaning into open source infrastructure to support their campaigns in a variety of different ways. Um, that's really clear, um, you know, more attack techniques, more and varied attack techniques. One of the things I think that, um, seems pretty obvious is from a monitoring and detection standpoint, right? Um, the days where you can just kind of disregard inbound, outbound traffic to open source package repositories is probably over, or or am I overreacting here? But should should security teams not necessarily look at pat traffic to and from a, a GitHub or an NPM or a Python package index as, oh, well, that's just, that's just clean development traffic um, and, and not say, hmm, you know, what's going on? Carlo, anyone? Uh, yeah, definitely. You can't take it as a clean traffic anymore. You need to analyze it. Any public service like Discord, Slack, I don't know. We have seen more routers abusing all of them. Dropbox, Google Drive, everything that is unusual, you yeah. should analyze it. And is there a way to distinguish the legitimate development um, traffic from stuff that's funky and warrants more investigation? Well, that's a hard question to answer. You need, but it's unlikely that you will be developing easy rules to detect such traffic. I think um, one of the things that came up with with the BitClip campaign, Carlo, is you know your your observation that attackers are also being a lot more stealthy with some of these supply chain campaigns, um, not just, you know, 
breaking the window and then, you know, running all over your organization that in, in that campaign, they were pretty quiet and pretty focused on getting the access and information they wanted. So not likely to set off triple, yeah, triple not, alarms and stuff. They're not greedy anymore. It's not, oh, yeah, I need a rootkit planted on your device. No, I want to steal your mnemonic. Okay, I'll take that and uh, give you what you, I'll give you what you want, the functionality. I'll just take something back for it and that's it. I don't need your computer as a resource. I just need your money. So it's hit and run and no permanent damage. It's just about stealing it at that moment. And uh, there are, there's more and more attacks that uh, we see where people aren't going to, okay, give me all your cookies, all logging credentials, give me everything. No, it's not anymore about that. It's about yeah. taking what they need and what's high of value for them. Yeah. The, the ransomware, you know, where, you know, everybody knows you've been hacked because, you know, your computer won't turn it on and they're, they're extorting you for money, right? You can't, you can't assume that that's going to be how these attacks are playing out. And, and Lucia, what, what, um, what are your, what's your takeaway or your advice for the listeners on just the using GitHub and these other open source package managers as malicious infrastructure? Um, you know, what should they be doing to kind of address that and maybe spot that within their own environment? I mean, as Carlos said, uh, it is it is a difficult question. It's very hard because we did see a rise on uh, GitHub being used as as part of supply chain attacks. We are also seeing a lot of malicious software on GitHub. A lot of them are very well documented. So anyone who doesn't know how to code uh, can basically take something, some malicious executable from GitHub and just run with it. Uh, so, you know, it, it is hard because, you know, open source and uh, repositories like npm pi pi or like open source uh, uh platforms uh, github and so on it is big and it's hard to track you know everything so yeah i think it's a bit, little bit of a problem mm. um before we go, I mean, are there are there any kind of final thoughts that you have for uh, first of all for the audience? If you if you have any questions, yeah, we'll we'll definitely take them now. Um, for our uh, expert guests, um, any any kind of closing closing thoughts or advice uh, for the folks who are on the webinar? We've uh, uh, we've talked talk about a lot. I can but, tell you. Yeah. You need to be aware, first takeaway is that public uh, infrastructure is actively abused by malicious actors. There, there's no more, okay, it's GitHub, uh, it's clean traffic or something like that. Keep an eye or, on anything that's even a bit suspicious in the network traffic. Uh, also, uh, try to use uh, reputable packages when you decide to use, but even those need to be security weighted and analyzed with dedicated security tools, which can help you detect malware in those packages. And don't hurry and use the package that was published yesterday. Give it a bit time before you right. use. It. Right. Let it let let it uh, let it sit there for a while. So yeah. that uh, yeah yeah. Um, yeah, and 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 even Nessa, even from from reputable um, uh, providers as well. That's right. I mean, it's, yes. Don't yeah. hurry with the latest version. Give it. There was some. Uh, I don't know anymore. I have read some uh, research where it said that around forty days, if you would, if everybody would wait fourteen days with uh, buying the latest version of a package, uh, like eighty percent of attacks. Yeah. Would, happen or will yeah. be prevented so yeah. give, it, give it time give it a bit time don't don't hurry up it's likely not the biggest uh get uh, a bit of you won't get so much if you use it now it's not so big hurry it's always good to update to cover vulnerabilities and such but usually with open source packages written in python and javascript and similar languages it's not worth hurrying mm -hmm. Yep. 
and uh, you know, be be vigilant about some of those some of those you know the to the extent that this is easy to spot. It's usually you know that that sketchy package name that's pretty close to a really well known one. But oh, you know what? I'm I'm misreading it. This isn't actually that you know that that type of stuff. The the um, package manager who's uh, you know the the hosting account that's new and and not very well built out. Uh, that those types of things, but you know. Those are not always indicative, but often they are. Um, for the folks on the line, we've got more uh, stuff coming up for you this month uh, and, and going into early April. Um, next week, we've got uh, SBOMs are having their moment. Um, Sasha uh, is is going to be on the line with Joe and, and Christopher Chan uh, to talk about how to actually use SBOMs. So it's not just a checkbox thing. Um, and we've got a session. We've we've you've heard um, Carlo and and Lucia and, and others talk about the Spectra Assure product. We have a, a kind of a product demo and Q and A to talk about uh, Spectra Assure um, later in uh, uh, in early April. That is uh, with Tomislav Perigin, who's our, our chief software architect, co-founder of Reversing Labs, and uh, Jasmine Noel, who's our senior product marketing manager. Uh, so that's coming up uh, in uh, early April, and uh, just put those ones on there. Put those in your calendar. Um, thanks very much, very much to uh, everyone who tuned in, and and thanks to all of you for taking time out of your day to uh, join us and talk about the research that you do. Keep up the great work. Thank you, Paul. It's great having you, and we'll we'll be doing this again in about um, three months. Uh, <laughs> so. Keep up the great work, and um, and I know for a fact that there's more great stuff coming from you all. So, all right, ciao. Bye. Bye. Bye.